All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Luba Vangelova. I am the founder of The Hub, and I am here with Miro Siegel and Brooklyn Wetzel. And we are hosting an information session that will acquaint uh, those of you who would like to know more about what we're doing, what we've been doing for our first year, and what we're doing the second year. Um, so now that we've gotten past our little technical difficulties, um, <laughs> I will just uh, introduce myself very briefly. Um, so I have been writing about self-directed education for many years for national media outlets such as uh, The Atlantic and the MindShift um, website, among others. Uh, and I've also been involved in numerous uh, independent learning co-ops. Um, as a co-founder and um, manager. And then last year I started The Hub. Um, and the centerpiece of it has been the um, two day a week online micro academy, uh, which Miro and Brooklyn are the facilitators of. Um, I'll let them just briefly introduce themselves um, and then I'll talk a bit more about the bigger picture and then hand it over to them to talk about uh, the details. Okay. I could introduce myself first. Um, so my name is Miro Siegel. Uh, I'm one of the co-facilitators of the Hubs Micro Academy, as Lucas stated, um, alongside Brooklyn. I have a lifelong experience with self-directed learner. I'm a grown self-directed learner myself. Um, and basically I'm bringing a lot of those skills that I've learned, uh, you know, from my own personal experience to working with children who are self-directed and are interested in a lot of different things. Um, just facilitating a lot of really great explorations with the hub. I'm really excited about it. So uh, I've done a number of projects uh, within this kind of sphere of self-directed learning um, and alternative education. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to be involved all the time. I'm Brooklyn Wetzel. Um, I'm a lifelong artist and entrepreneur, and I feel that though, that because of that, that has just naturally been a self-directed learner because the skills of self-directed learning are essential to um, creativity and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm the parent of two self-directed inquiry-based learners. Um, and so I've been in, in self-directed learning as a facilitator for my kids for eight years, and this will be my fifth year as a facilitator within a community. All right, thank you both. And so the big picture of the hub. Um, so the intention um, in starting the hub was to create um, a space which for now is online. Um, and the plan is to also add a physical space in the fall of 2022 um, that offers the best of both worlds, customization and community. Uh, so there's the micro academy part, which is uh, more of a long term cohort experience uh, where the participants really get to know each other, really get to dive deeply into things. Uh, and then there are occasional a la carte programs that are just one offs um, and summer camps will be running uh, a summer camp actually later this month. Um, and uh, that's the, the structure and the goals uh, for the micro academy um, specifically are to expand the participants horizons to develop skills and knowledge, um, both in the sphere of what we would consider academics, but also in uh, social and personal development. Um, and also to develop a sense of community and belonging and um, just feeling part of something bigger. And um, uh, those are basically the principles Brooklyn and Miro will delve into a lot of this in much more detail. Um, so if uh, you could talk first about, uh, since the one of the goals of the first year, which started in September of 2021 was to first and foremost, build a solid, appropriate culture. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, how do you define 
uh, a good culture for this kind of experience, given that um, that the micro academy is intended to be a co-created experience between the facilitators and the younger participants. Um, so there's a lot of uh, space for the children's interests to uh, be tapped into and to kind of build on their strengths and so on. But what kind of culture supports that sort of um, setting? And how did you achieve the culture and why is it important? Well, the first things that come to mind um, for me is um, just a culture of curiosity and support. Um, being a, everyone feeling engaged and connected and wanting to be there. Um, you know, having a culture of joy, um, especially in the di digital space um, is something that we work really hard to cultivate. And we do that through inclusion and flexibility and um, a hefty sense of humor. Um, so I, I think that um, much like a building in a physical space, we just work really hard to, um, to have a sense of purpose in everything that we do and, and um, really collaborate with everyone and everyone is equal and has a voice and feels heard. So those are some of the principles that, that I come to the space with um, as a tool to build our culture. Definitely. And uh, we also have a number of, you know, community agreements and a few tenets, uh, you know, in our code of conduct, essentially. Um, and really the, the common element in all of these agreements is respect. And so that's something that we are very intentional about, you know, from the onset when we're creating this culture within a, you know, a community. Um, but it's not enough just to have those ideas to begin with. And what we decided to do was to make the creation of this culture an ongoing hands-on process that every member of the community has some stake in and they have ownership over, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of the participants that come on um, that, you know, we have these meetings with, they're as much responsible for helping us build a community that we want to have together and build a culture that we want to have together. And uh, by making it a hands-on process, we're really just strengthening it so much, you know, by, by getting everybody involved. That's the only way to do it. And so can you talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how do you create a culture? I mean, I think part of it is the decision-making process that's used. Um, so if you could explain that and any of the other kind of- And um, then we use, we had we've tried different methods of um, voting and um, creating a democratic system to decide what we do via consensus. Um, so those are another one. Mira, do you want to step in? Sure. Yeah, I want to say um, all these systems um, are they also function on a non hierarchical system, right? So uh, you know the social there is no social hierarchy within these meetings. Um, Brooklyn and I are not uh, superiors. We are, we're facilitators, but we, at the end of the day, our voice has as much say in the community as the participants. So it's really important that, um, you know, that has to be the case for all of us to feel that we have some say or equal amounts of say. And using that system moving forward, um, we, in this last uh, term, for example, one of our group projects was to, like Brooklyn said, essentially create a system of governance that worked for all of the members um, and was essentially a tool that all the members could use to make sure that their voices were heard and that everybody was doing what they wanted to be doing. Um, and so this was something that we came up with, with the uh, participants themselves. We created all of these different roles. Um, we took input from everybody. We figured out, uh, you know, what the best way to cast votes would be. We tried, a, we experimented with a couple of different systems. When one didn't work, when one left somebody feeling that they hadn't been heard, we changed it. And so this process of change in of itself was also, uh, you know, I would say a pretty big tool um, to make sure that everybody is heard and that we're building the culture that works for us. Okay. And um, I'll just jump in there um, because 
a lot of the viewers may not have heard of a game shifting board. Um, and so if you could just explain, because the term might um, lead, uh, I guess, people to think that it's for playing games, but it's really a much bigger thing. It, it's not really about games. So game shifting board is a tool in the agile, is it part of the agile learning network? They have different tools that were taken from um, software development teams. And so there are ways to organize your time um, visually and um, and just kind of create, um, put some, there is a certain level of playfulness involved, in, but it, it's like a playful way to organize time in a serious way. So the game shifting board has different intentions for the beginning of our meeting. Like, are we going to decide something? Are we going to explain something? Are we going to ask a what if question? What are, what's, what's our first interaction going to be? What's our final question of the day and our final circle going to be? So we have all these choices for how we interact at the beginning and the end. And then also we have like a break. Do we have an activity on our break? Sometimes we do a scavenger hunt or an obstacle course. Um, so we have choices for what kind of activity we might do on the break off screen. Um, so the game master would kind of choose all of these uh, different activities for the like the signposts in our day. Okay. And um, so can you also just talk a little bit about why it's so important to have the culture as a foundation and how, you know, without the right culture, it's a lot harder to get the other things, you know, right. <laughs> well, I think first and foremost, you can learn anything, but that's not the important part. The important thing is learning how to learn, right? And that's kind of where creating a culture is really important. And what we're doing together is we're essentially deciding um, how we want to go about exploring different topics. And without a culture that is friendly, without a culture that uh, allows um, people to feel safe in exploring these things, it kind of cuts us off from a, a really huge degree of learning. And so I think that that's really why creating a culture where everybody feels safe, where everybody feels inspired and passionate um, is, is really important, as well as um, the social element uh, is hugely important to our model and to how this whole thing works. Um, there's so much social learning that comes from, you know, just us experiencing things together. And without a good culture, that really isn't possible. And through collaboration, we can inspire each other and support each other in our individual goals. And that's what we do. That's the, the base for the, the, for the hub is being able to get everybody where they wanna be. All right. And uh, let's see. So can you also talk a little bit about the structure and um, how uh, basically striking a balance between um, structure, organization uh, and flexibility and also, how do you strike the balance, uh, as I like to call it, between the me and the we? If we're trying to be, you know, uh, as inquiry-based and interest-based as possible, I mean, different children, different participants have different interests. So how do you um, kind of make it a cohesive whole? I think that the, one of the things you know, kind of what we were saying before is because we're, we're building this culture of caring and inclusion, then everyone wants to work together to, um, to meet the needs of me and the we, and everyone knows that they will be heard. So they feel, um, they feel comfortable bringing their, their needs and their ideas to the group. And then because people are, be, are exploring those, they also want to give back. So we, and you know, that's kind of an underlying part of the culture and also something we model. Absolutely. And uh, speaking to the actual structure of the day itself, like how we spend our time, that is also a very collaborative effort in figuring out what we're doing with our time, right? 
Um, so the game shifting board, as Brooklyn described it, is one of the tools that we use to do that. Um, but there's a lot of conversing and there's a lot of discussion. And, you know, sometimes I feel as though actually reaching a conclusion or reaching a consensus on what we want to do together is almost as much of an exercise as the, the actual activity itself. Um, so there are a lot of, there, we spend a lot of time discussing and we're very intentional about that, making sure everybody is happy, um, coming to solutions, uh, yeah, problem solving. And I, and we, um, you know, at the beginning when a group is first getting to know them, know each other, then that's a lot where the flexibility is, where we're, um, you know, we have a certain structure for the day where we're like, we meet for 45 minutes and then we have a 15 minute break. It's, and then another 45 minutes and a 15 minute break. Um, and during that time, we, um, we can change around what we do depending on what the group needs. If we need to be doing team building and, and getting to know each other, then that those time slots can be full of that. And then we discover each other and our interests and we start exploring the world. And then eventually we make goals for group projects. And then I mean, this is how both terms went and they were very different each time. Um, you know, but eventually we got out of the playing and getting to know each other and we wanted to create together and then we wanted more structure. So it's it's a process of accommodating all the evolution of the group. Yes. And uh, so the sessions um, I should add are four hours long from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it actually started out a little bit shorter, but then was lengthened um, by request of the families and uh, the participants. And we've actually gotten some requests to expand to three days, but we'll maybe consider that for next year. Uh, I mean, for the year after. Um, but um, there's been a general sense, I think, that the sessions pass really quickly. <laughs> Can you explain why? I mean, is it because of just the level of engagement? Um, you know, why is that? Yeah, I definitely would say um, the old adage is true. Time does fly when you're having fun. And uh, the truth of it is we focus on making this experience joyful, like Brooklyn said at the beginning of the session. You know, we want this to be something that everybody enjoys. Um, you know, we do a lot of team building, we play a lot of games, we talk about a lot of interesting topics. And yeah, that eats up a lot of time just because uh, uh, of how, you know, fascinating it is. So I think that, yeah, I would say it is in large part due to the level of engagement. I don't think there's ever a dull moment. Yeah. And could you talk about some of the topics that have come up for exploration that have been suggested either by the younger participants or by yourselves that you know got people really engaged? I mean, for a while, I think you were talking about philosophy and kind of very meta things and Greek mythology. Um, can you just maybe name a handful of topics that were just really, you know, led to really engaging conversations? Sure. Um, I think, and I might be a little biased on this one because this also happens to be one of my favorite uh, fields. Um, but I mean, history is always something that leads to so many amazing conversations. We talk a lot about world history, which is, you know, what I love, but we also talk a lot about, you know, American history. We talk about, we end up looking at like politics. We end up, that takes us to a lot of different places. And, uh, it's always a conversation. It's never just one person kind of telling the group. I mean, if one person is knowledgeable about a subject, at, by all means, but it always turns into a conversation rather than a lecture. Mm -hmm. So we end up exploring all kinds of different things and history is uh, a really big one. There was this one game that we really liked as a group uh, that we created called uh, Historic Showdown. And what that was is we created a bunch of really funny prompts of uh, just random things. It was something like who would bake the best cake, you know, just stuff like that. And the challenge was every participant had to um, pick three historical figures before knowing what the prompt was, just at random. And then the prompt was revealed and everybody was like, okay, now I have to do my research. Why would, so my figures are Abraham Lincoln, Darwin, 
uh, and Marie Antoinette. And uh, who would bake the best cake? And now I have to do all this Google research and figure it out and see if I can find any interesting tidbits that I can use to help argue my case. And, you know, just we play a lot of games and create a lot of activities like that to put the learning into context, right? And uh, that that's a personal favorite of mine. Do you have one, Brooklyn? We do a lot of world exploring, you know? The internet has so much information about anywhere, about everything and everywhere that, you know, something will come up and we'll look at it on a map, we'll tour that area um, and look at the Wikipedia and, you know, look at different sources. And, um, and you said you mentioned politics, it was the election year. So we talked a lot about elections and different ways of counting votes and different ways that that had happened over time. So current events is also a big thing that we discuss. And then, you know, we play um, like trivia games. We do math together and these are requests and everyone's excited to do it. And um, what kind of blew my mind, uh, I think it was in the first term was just, like I said, some of the meta kind of philosophical discussions. I can't remember exactly which one just really um, kind of blew me away that children in this age group would be like really interested in discussing. I don't know if you, either of you remember just to kind of give us an example, but um, you know, I think a lot of times adults um, kind of don't take into account the, the deep kind of topics that children in this age group are interested in discussing and, and learning about if given the opportunity to do it in a certain way. Right. I, think I think that was your questioning exercise, Miro. Yes. Which, yeah. We talked about, I think specifically we talked about family. We talked about ideas about self. I talked about ideas about others and culture and society, just like really big topics. Um, and it really is what we both just pointed out. I think what's important to focus on is the opportunity to discuss these things, right? Because at first glance, we might think, you know, participants within this age range, maybe they're not interested by it. And yeah, you're right. Maybe, maybe they're not. And sometimes they aren't. And uh, not all of the activities that are suggested or all the things that we land upon are always hits, right? Um, but what's important is that we create the opportunity for those topics to be explored in the first place. And sometimes they hit in a really big way. And we end up having really intense, involved conversations about really meta topics like philosophy, like, uh, you know, politics, like history, like current events. So yeah. All right. And um, I think you, I mean, you've also Part of what you brought in um, in the second term was kind of a theater, I guess, um, session at the end where you watched videos that had been uh, found and requested. And um, so those covered all sorts of topics, including, I mean, in addition to the topics you've mentioned about conversations, I mean, I think there were certainly videos having to do with um, various elements of science. Um, and I, I think art has been um, part of the um, session uh, experience as a whole. And I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think the sessions over the two terms have managed to touch on all the things that are kind of considered discrete subjects in um, kind of traditional school environments, but in a way that doesn't separate them, I think artificially, I would say, into subjects. Because I mean, life is just, you know, it's, it's, you don't go about your life thinking about the world in terms of subjects. Um, so it's kind of a very interdisciplinary, very fluid way of learning about these things. I mean, would you say that, you know, what are considered subjects and topics kind of really, kind of flowed into each other and you know I, I I would think that that created a more deep understanding of of these things rather than looking at them in isolation in kind of a more mechanistic way I agree I, I also think that because 
the we're on the internet. I mean, the the sessions take place on the internet, and the internet is a uh, is the human's library we have instant access to information about any topic that might be related with what we're talking about and we can just go and find that information one of the roles that we actually had on a daily basis was a fact checker so people could be to say i want to be the fact checker for the day and it's a popular role you know and it's part of i think a big part of the hub is digital literacy and you know learning how to find different sources and discuss things and look at them from all angles. Yeah, definitely. I think um, approaching all these things from a kind of like a multidisciplinary uh, standpoint is really important because it gives us a greater understanding of these topics when we can look at them from many different angles. And we, I think we do, as Brooklyn said, obviously these take place on the internet. And I think we do very much uh, embody that C-related um you know mentality of we'll be on one topic and then we'll be like really into it and then somebody will say oh well did you know that this has to do with this and then we find ourselves in a completely different topic and a different field but now we have the context and understanding to see how the how they're related and and how these things uh you know act well, how they relate to each other so yeah connecting the dots and understanding the bigger picture um, I think is one thing that has come out of that. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit more about the role of you as facilitators and the role of the younger participants? You know, what do each bring to the table? Um, and you mentioned at one point modeling. Um, and I know you mentioned that there's an equal say, but at the end of the day also, the two of you are in charge. And if there's any kind of, um, whatever, uh, behavior, let's say that is counter to the culture. I mean, I think anyone probably has um, the ability to say something about it. But at the end of the day, the two of you are Kind of directing this in in a certain sense so could you just describe how the roles break out uh, i would describe our main responsibility as facilitators is to uh, not only hold space for the other participants but to protect that space um, so we've created a really amazing space for all of these different kinds of interactions and engagements for our participants as facilitators um, it's on us to make sure that as you said, the culture is being maintained. And so, yes, when, when there are behaviors that are counterintuitive or counterproductive to that goal, um, what we'll try to do is we'll try to resolve it in a way that you know leaves everybody happy. Um, and so I guess, uh, yeah, I guess all those things just are rolled into the role of facilitator from my eyes, um, as well as, you know, if there are things that the participants can't do on their own, such as, you know, set up, um, and account for this one activity that we want to do um, that and it needs to be vetted and all that obviously that falls on us as facilitators as well um, so we're really just there to make sure that all these opportunities can happen in a safe way um, and in a way that you know feels good for the group I consider like a facility like the role of a facilitator is kind of a guide you know but like a very supportive guide um, you know, not just like a tourist guide, but someone who will really be there for you and and um, help you through the process. And that could be the interpersonal process of like navigating um, relationships, or it might be navigating the digital space, um, or you know, finding resources um, for your interests or things. That, you know, you might not be aware of um, different opportunities to study. You know, a participant might not be aware that because they're into Greek mythology, there's these websites and these other courses and different ways that they can learn about that. And part of our goal, our part of our purpose is to share those things and the knowledge that we have, um, you know, being older and having more experience in, in this arena. So, um, you know, we're here to be an open book and share all of the information that we have and to be a good guide for our group. And also to learn alongside the participants too, you know, like 
we're exploring a lot of things that I might not necessarily myself be very knowledgeable about, but I take that as an opportunity to learn about these things alongside the participants. And I think that that goes kind of back to the modeling uh, thing that Brooklyn was talking about, modeling that great behavior. Um, and it's, it's also just a lot of fun for us. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, modeling, um, you were saying the importance of learning how to learn. And so you're also modeling how to learn. And um, I mean, in, in a sense, this is also a learning environment for, for everyone, including the facilitators. And I think, I mean, uh, I think it's been said that that's one of the reasons why it's also you know, not putting words in your mouth right now, but like enjoyable for you, but that makes it, you know, even more enjoyable for you. Mm -hmm. um, we're just, we're active participants. Yes. Yeah. I think that that's very different because we're not just something like, this is the activity we're doing and you guys are doing it and I'm waiting for you to finish. We're all doing this activity. So I'm also writing the poem. I'm also like doing the game and I'm, I'm, I'm just right there with you. Yeah. So I think that that leads to a lot of mutual respect as well. Yeah, and also just like you said, modeling how you people with a lot more life and learning experience, how you're going about these things and then the children can see that and kind of see, you know, which things are, um, you know, more uh, productive, which things are less productive and so on. And um, so uh, the, um, so, so these are nine to 12 year olds uh, in the first year, we're expanding it to nine to 13 year olds this, um, this coming year. Um, I got some feedback from uh, parents that um, some leadership skill development was definitely observed over the course of, you know, the terms. And um, so, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the younger participants also kind of stepped up <laughs> to, um, because I would say because of the um, dynamic of being guides by the side rather than the, you know, proverbial stage on, sage on the stage, um, that it, created space for the younger participants to step up and develop more leadership um, abilities. Yeah. So um, could you talk a little bit more about some of the tools and features? I know you mentioned for culture creation, there was a game shifting board. Um, could you talk a, a bit about some of the other things that were used like the wonder wall, guest speaker, field trips and um, how you use those. Sure. Um, I would preface this by saying I think part of the beauty of these sessions is the fact that all of the tools that we use, there is nothing that is set in stone. Everything is evolving as well with the culture of the group. Um, we figure out what works, what feels good to use, what feels natural to use. You know, if something feels forced, we drop it a lot of the time and we, we just try to find something that fills that gap that it left behind. Um, and so, uh, you know, like I think the Wonder Wall is a good example of that. Um, but we use a number of tools. For example, the Wonder Wall uh, is a place where we can go ask questions and seek answers, um, you know, in a communal way. We have our game shifting board. Uh, we also, uh, I think I explained it a little bit before, but we've created, you know, a system of governance that we dubbed the Hubbardment. Um, <laughs> Um, and that had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of leadership built into that. And there were a lot of different roles that participants took on, um, Brooklyn and myself included. Um, and these are all things that we developed as we went. Um, but what's really important, I think, is the development of these tools um, as a process. Uh, and uh, that's something that is, you know, constant it we're constantly working towards that and building new things that work and enriching our learning space um and we have a digital space that's completely chock full of uh these tools that we are able to use that was what i was going to mention um we have a base camp um space that's a um, digital space for us to share discuss things post um post our work 
do collaborations, um, have a bulletin board with resources. So um, I know I'd mentioned earlier digital literacy. I think that this is kind of a part of that, um, having different digital spaces and learning how to navigate them as part of a team. Um, and I and I think that that has you know is great skill building um, for how everyone interacts in um, all sorts of organizations and businesses. So that's been really important. We also have had guest speakers, and um, we've even like went on a live tour of France. Um, so we've had a we have a bunch of different tools and like opportunities, and we bring those to the group, and you know they often want to try new things because people are curious, naturally curious and naturally want to learn. So we've explored a lot of different things. And could you talk a little bit about the, um, the field trips um, in France? Because those were also not a conventional kind of traditional field trip where there's someone leading it who has a certain agenda in mind of what they want to say and what they want to do and everyone just kind of follows along and um, listens. So could you talk about how even like the field trips were sort of a co-created experience? Well I would say first off it was really great working with our tour operator. Um, they were very intentional about uh, you know making sure that it was an interactive experience so as we were going, we had the ability to ask questions. We had the ability to, you know, kind of take some kind of control and agency over what was happening. And uh, that really, you know, it, I can at least speak from my own personal experience, that piqued my interest because uh, I was much more interested in that than, let's say, you know, on a, being on a predetermined track. Um, so we were able to actually explore France, even though we were, you know, on our our screens mm -hmm. um but you know it it definitely what it felt a lot more like i was actually there right. there's also a sense like there's this world connection that we have at the hub because we're all at different places and so I, I think that you know that makes us feel like we're like all citizens of the world and we're just everywhere together um and that leads to a lot of learning and connection as well that's right. So um, the fact that, you know, different participants and the facilitators are in different geographic locales, I mean, you get to learn um, just through natural conversation something about other parts of the country and other parts of the world, because not everyone is, is in the US has <laughs> participated. So um, it's kind of an organic a kind of social learning uh, in a way about geography and culture. And it helps contextualize these subjects that are often very like abstract, right? You know, like um, because we, we have this ability to go and explore France, um, we took a little bit of an interest in French history. And I remember we watched, uh, going back to the theater that we have, we watched uh, a number of videos on like the French Revolution and like, you know, French history. And I think that that definitely, you know, watching those videos, having those conversations, talking about these things, and then quote unquote going there, uh, help us place uh, a lot of that learning and contextualize it even further. Um, make it personal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and also because there was um, agency in helping choose what was watched and so on, um, I think that I imagine led to you know greater engagement in the topics also versus just being told this is what you're going to this is, not this is what you're going to learn now I mean really what people mean is this is what I'm going to talk to you about now because no one can really control what the other person learns but if they're choosing something that means they're asking to learn it I mean if they are actively you know involved in the decision that you know they're they're choosing to learn, so they're going to listen. You know, I mean. Um, so, could you talk about the group projects, how those were decided, and what was done, and some of the outcomes? Sure, um, I'll I can speak to our most recent group project. Uh, it's you know it's the freshest, I guess. <laughs> um, and basically, what we decided to do was 
we had done a number of activities and it was only about halfway through the term that we had finally landed on a group project that we were all comfortable with, you know, running with, that we were all excited about. And it was actually stemming from a few activities that we had done previously in the term, which uh, were, it started off as a, um, a collaborative poetry writing exercise that we did just to warm up. And then that quickly evolved and morphed into a collaborative story writing process that we created together. And we just loved that activity so much that we found ourselves going back to it time and time again. You know, the participants were like, let's do that again. Let's just keep writing. And what we ended up with was a huge collection of short stories. I think it was something like 25 short stories that were collaboratively written by all the participants of the hub. Um, and we had this great amount of work on our hands and we decided as a group, well, let's make this something. Let's, let's actually try and make this into a book. Let's structure this, let's edit it, let's format it. Let's do all the steps involved. And so we took it on, um, we organized, we, we found suitable jobs for everyone that everybody wanted to do, was excited about. Um, and Part before- of our production team. Exactly. And before we knew it, we had uh, a completed book that was about 90 pages that we had formatted uh, online. And um, at the end of the term, we presented it to um, parents of the participants as well as friends that were invited. And uh, it, was, it was a pretty amazing process from start to finish. Um, yeah, I think it was a huge success. We had illustrators, we had editors, we had writers, we had uh, you know, formatters, it was awesome. And Lula, you were there for that presentation. Uh, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, everyone, um, all, all the adults were pretty bold over judging from the comments being made uh, during the presentations at how creative and um, engaging the stories were and also in um, how they, you know, the, how enthusiastic the children were to present them to the adults. Um, and it was also, I think, really interesting to all the adults, the collaborative process that you used to write every single story. It's not like, you know, one person wrote this story, one person wrote this story, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So every single short story that was in that collection um, was one sixth of it was written by every participant. So every single participant had a hand in every single story. Um, and we took on this process. Originally, this was something we did with poetry, which was much shorter form, but we took this on with uh, story writing. And it was just a really good exercise in, in patience, in teamwork and collaboration, in uh, not getting too attached to your creation as well, um, which is something that you know creatives can sometimes struggle with. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty interesting how we ended up doing it. What do you think, Brooklyn? And I was just going to say shifting viewpoints. I think that was a really great exercise and just like, you know, you didn't get to set the intention of the story, but you had to just put yourself in it and get into the, you know, a creative group that someone else had set. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I was going to mention that that the, the first term we did something a little different. We did a world building. We kind of created a whole world and all of the characters and lore within the world. And then as our final project, we developed like different projects related to the world, um, which were like stories and Minecraft worlds and um, you know, presentations and things like that, all relating around a world that we had created together. Yes, one participant had made a few levels of a video game that related to it. Um, there were, you know, like article pieces that had been written um, kind of in like a nonfiction way about this fictional world. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of really interesting mediums came from that. Yeah. All righty. And uh, let's see. So in the course of all these things, um, and, and I should add the group projects spanned not just weeks, but um, it, was, it was 
you know, more than a month, um, I think, in, in both cases. So these were long term projects that did require, you know, also time management, <laughs> project management, and all these kind of um, more executive kind of um, functioning skills. Um, and also, how did um, the children kind of keep each other accountable. I mean, so these were group projects and yet it didn't seem like anyone was kind of trying to slack off and, <laughs> you know, do as little as possible. You know, how, could you talk a little bit about the accountability and doing these things as a group and um, what role that plays? I think people have a lot of pride in the connection and, and the culture that we're building. So they want to participate to the best of their ability. Um, and I think that that comes naturally out of having a joyful and engaged environment. I also think it was a very, I mean, it's fun. It's fun to work on stuff like this um, with a bunch of people who you consider your friends. Um, and, and I think for another really important thing is that this, it never felt forced at any time, you know? None of the activities were forced. Uh, we didn't say like, oh, this is what we're doing. We have to do this. It was more of a commitment to, well, we, we all committed to doing this and we're going to try to you know, finish our commitment. Um, how should we best go about that? So we would spend a lot of time asking that question rather than saying, rather than us imposing how we thought it would be best to finish the project, we asked the group that instead and then tried to follow through. So everybody, it felt like everybody was doing their part rather than everybody was doing the thing that they had to do. Mm -hmm. We're really working towards something that we can be proud of, not working yeah. towards like a specific evaluation of our work. Right. You know, it's just an internal evaluation that we're doing the best that we can do. Okay. All right. Um, so that brings me to the question of, you know, since there are no tests per se, I mean, in a sense, there's kind of a natural or organic sort of test in that, did we achieve what we set out to do? I mean, that's kind of rather than an imposed sort of artificial test, that's kind of the, the kind of test that you encounter in the world as an adult over and over and over again. I mean, you know, we as adults aren't sitting down and taking tests, but we're tested, you know, just organically over and over and over again in terms of did we achieve what we set out to do or not, <laughs> right? And there's no grade involved, but it's pretty obvious, you know, you can kind of gauge, well, I managed to do what I set out to do, um, you know, I. Uh, made my goal or I didn't or or I I achieved part of my goal um, and that's kind of the feedback you get and then you can hopefully do better next time if if you didn't achieve what you wanted or you can reevaluate your objectives if it turned out that what you set out to do um, if kind of the situation shifted and so that no longer became a desirable objective I mean it's it's much more organic but can you talk a bit about the knowledge and skills that were gained through the two terms. Um, like how, how do you know what was learned without, you know, artificial tests, <laughs> um, as I would, you know, consider a lot of tests. Um, how do you know what was learned? and uh, not just academically, but also in the kind of social, emotional, community skills uh, realm? I guess my answer would actually encompass both of those things, academically and socially. Um, I think it's pretty easy to tell, um, you know, what has been learned, what knowledge is being retained, just by listening in on the conversations that are happening, you know, inside of our community. Uh, you know, we might be talking about history, we might be talking about uh, a lot of these different topics, um, and there's a lot of information there, but really I know that the participants have retained it and have picked it up when I hear them talking to each other about it and really discussing these things and asking questions to each other about them. Um, because, you know, 
and, and that's, you know, that's them improving their, their social abilities, uh, as well as exploring academically uh, the things that they've been exposed to. Um, and just how you were saying how that you, they, when a participant steps into a leadership role, I feel that that is like proof of learning and growing um, using critical thinking and, you know, the develop, like asking questions and putting forth um, activities to the group or are, are part of that as well. And then like, obviously I, I mentioned digital, digital liter literacy skills and collaboration skills. And we can see those um, just as the group grows and, and, you know, builds that muscle. And I know, you know, from my experience as a youth in, in groups that the, that, that collaboration and practicing that interact, those kind of interactions has been, is incredibly useful as I move forward in life. And uh, included in that would be presumably problem solving skills, like learning how maybe to um, get less frustrated and stuck and find a way out of things um, or know when or how to turn to someone for assistance and so on. Absolutely. It's it does get a little difficult when you ask like how do you gauge soft well soft skill development right like how do, it's difficult those are really really uh subtle things but they're oftentimes the most important like you said time management interpersonal relationships uh you know problem solving conflict resolution i guess it's kind of the same thing but yeah i those are things that are explored on a daily basis and i guess the way that we can tell that those, are, those skills are being developed are when they're being used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and the impact that this development and also just the overall experience had on the participants, I know that, um, I mean, I heard from you that there wasn't a dry eye in the closing circle at the end of the term. Um, so, I mean, to me, that speaks volumes about the impact that um, the experience had. So it's, it's, you know, more than just kind of building skills and knowledge. It's, it's having an emotional impact, clearly, mm -hmm. on the participants. That, that was, you know, it wasn't coming into the hub last fall. I wasn't expecting it to necessarily be as deep and connected as we were, but we spent, you know, just through the digital space, right? Because this is the first time I had facilitated in a digital environment, so I didn't know what to expect. But um, we built real connections, and um, those connections were, you know, weren't just between a, like, teacher and a student, but they were, like, real friendships within our group. So, it was it was hard to say goodbye to our to our last cohort for sure. And uh, so, could you talk a little bit about next term? So there'll be you know we're having a summer break now, and then uh, the fall term starts in mid September. Uh, so can you talk about what next year will look like? How it will build on this year, but also how it will kind of expand in some ways. Well, I definitely know that um, we're very intentional about bringing in, um, you know, more, I guess, external resources. So we want to do a lot more field trips. We want to do bring in a lot more guest speakers. So those are things that we're uh, definitely talking about and we're trying to explore. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, it's hard to say exactly how things will develop, right? And that's the beauty of it. We're we're gonna meet a, a new group of participants, create a new community um, with ultimately a new culture and uh, just develop that and see how it goes. I was thinking, you know, as the, the world, like last year being in the pandemic and in lockdowns, it was kind of a different um, a feeling. I feel like coming into this new year as things open up, you know, will our, the feeling will be different and we'll be opening up more to, um, you know, to those guest speakers and to field trips and things like that. Okay. All right. Um, 
And so thank you for that. And um, so I'll just uh, wrap it up by um, talking a little bit about the enrollment process. Um, if you have an interest in possibly um, being part of this um, or having your child or children be part of this. So we are accepting applications for ages nine to 13 for the fall. And you can go to uh, our website, thehub.community and just fill out the contact form expressing your interest and in explaining, um, you know, the, the reason for your interest, uh, you know, why you think your child or children would be a good fit. And then it's a pretty organic process. There are also um, open houses that we're doing regularly. The next one is actually tomorrow. And then we have one in August. Um, those are under the events tab on the webpage uh, and we'll be running more um, during, you know, each term also for people. Uh, those will be um, hour and a half long mini sessions uh, facilitated by Miro in Brooklyn that give a taste of what the Hub Micro Academy experience is like. Um, and then we just have a kind of a very casual back and forth conversation just, um, you know, with uh, the parent who expresses interest and get, get to know the child or children in the open houses. And then uh, we just can each determine if it's a good fit. And um, that's it. I mean, we um, just do things the way it um, feels like it makes sense, you know, less of a kind of transactional culture and more of a relational culture. And um, so that's it. If uh, you're interested, please get in touch. And um, thank you for listening. <laughs>